Hi, this is Matt Skinner with a special announcement. Starting this Wednesday, May 17th, every dollar to the Working Preacher Spring Campaign will be matched dollar for dollar up to $10,000. And don't forget about the additional Sermon Brainwave content that your gift will unlock. Working Preacher relies on people like you to provide new content every week. Be sure to make your gift before May 31st to double your impact and unlock your additional content at workingpreacher.org. We are so grateful to each and every one of you who has given generously already. Thank you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The seventh Sunday of Easter falls on May 21st, 2023. And the texts are from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 14, Psalm 68, 1 through 10, and 32 through 35, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14, and then 5, 6 through 11. The gospel text is John 17, verses 1 through 11. We do not have a separate ascension podcast this year because we thought our last one was brilliant but this one uh not necessarily this the pen the ascension texts but some people do mark the feast of the ascension on the seventh sunday of easter and the texts that are assigned i think are especially good for for doing that um it at least points you to questions about that so um, we are here to help. Just like if you are looking for books about preaching, we've got some that can help as well. Caroline, any recommendations if people yeah. are looking for Aww, books on preaching, you. things that, they should know about? That, that little uh, plug, I appreciate it. This just came out about a month ago, maybe a couple weeks ago, Preaching the Word, Contemporary Approaches to the Bible for the Pulpit. This was my uh, sabbatical project. And so if you're looking in particular for a book that is going to catch you up, uh, introduce you to ways in which we approach scripture, particularly through contextual situational perspectives like disability, trauma, uh, queer, feminist, African-American, this is your book. And I bring it to a passage in John. And uh, But unfortunately, John 17 doesn't show up in the book. What's the title again? It is called Preaching the Word, Contemporary Approaches to the Bible for the Pulpit. So, yeah, thanks. But I don't talk about John 17. At least I don't think I do. Well, then we should Maybe probably talk should, about it now. It. <laughs> yeah. So, but we should talk about John 17. So as we know, every year on the seventh Sunday of Easter, we have a portion of the high priestly prayer. And so this is year A, so we get the first section and then year B, we get the second section and year C, we get the third section. But your reference, Matt, to the Ascension one of the things that this would be a really wonderful text to talk about the Ascension, because it, while never narrated in the Gospel of John, is absolutely essential to John's overall sense of an understanding of what God has done in Jesus and Jesus' own ministry. And so it always assumes the Ascension which we get so much of in the farewell discourse, which we've already done. I'm going to prepare a place for you, you know, abiding place for you. But it's really the full extent of, of Jesus' ministry that, you know, the resurrection is, woohoo, that's great. The resurrection, you know, I've still got my lily back there. Uh, that's wonderful, but it's not actually the end of what, of, of Jesus coming in, in the flesh. And so, and what does that ascension mean? What does that ascension look like? Why do we talk about that? We talk about that in our creeds. What difference does it make? And the answer to that is verse three. And this is eternal life, that you that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That eternal life, that that 
Jesus, that preparation that to welcome us into that abiding place, that ascension is not a gift of immortality. <laughs> uh, it is the ascension is that promise is here and now that eternal life is simply knowing deeply, intimately God in Jesus and Jesus and God. And that it's, it's, I talk about this a lot with people, uh, both with preachers and with lay people. And it still remains a concept that is so foreign mm -hmm. to so many people because we, uh, so much of our imagination about eternal life is that mansion in heaven, postponement of, of that reality, the, you know, immor the gift of Im resurrection and immortality. And it really isn't, uh, oh at least for John. So I think it's a, I think it's a beautiful promise so, that we, we know that here and now. And yeah. I find myself referencing John 17, three, um, the way, uh, I grew up referencing John three sixteen. Um, because of this idea, what is eternal life? And eavesdropping on Jesus' prayer, we find out that this life eternal is to know God and to know the one whom God has sent. Mm -hmm. And that brings the story full circle because in the beginning, and I'm going to go all the way to the first chapter of the first book, that would be Genesis. In the beginning, God was in relationship with the first humans and they walked out of the story and God has been rewriting the story to restore us to that intimacy. We chose the knowledge of everything else and walked out of, to use the text from last week, abiding with Jesus, uh, abiding with God. And in that, loss, everything that God has been doing is to restore us to that relationship. So life, as opposed to the death that was the result of the fall, life is a restored knowledge of who God is and who we are in God. Wow, is that not good news? Mm -hmm. I don't have much to add. <laughs> Except to say the ascension is vitally important in Luke Acts as well, but it maybe is. it's too soon to jump there. But yeah, yeah. for different reasons, but, yeah, mm -hmm. right. I think we but we have here the two New Testament authors who I think are the most interested in the ascension, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not just in terms of did it happen, but what does it mean? But also, how is it integrally related to everything else Jesus does? So there is no. I think I think this is true for both John and for Luke and Acts, but in different ways that crucifixion on its own, not that it doesn't have any meaning, but you can't talk about it by itself. Resurrection, you can't talk about by itself. Ascension by itself. And I think, again, both for John and for Acts, but in different ways, the sending of the Spirit. And so a lot of this comes out in Peter's Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2, that all of these are connected, cross, resurrection, ascension, pouring out of the Spirit. And for Acts, it's less about the place. Where has Jesus gone to? He's no longer down here. He's up there. It's not so much about that spatially, physically, cosmologically, as much as it's about Jesus now having ascended to this position of being Lord over all and of being this historical, historic mover of what happens in the world and what takes place in the world and having not necessarily a kind of control or determinism over it, but being a driving force in human history, which again is also weird, I think, for our, our post-enlightenment minds to, to get around because we have all of these philosophical questions about causality and what it means to be human. But the point is uh, from there, from this ascended state, Jesus is able to be present now in ways more powerful, more, um, more saturating throughout all of human experience mm -hmm. than he was previously. In other words, it's a step up in how Luke and Acts imagine it. I think in John, it's a little bit more of a restoration back to this original relationship with God, but mm -hmm. 
I don't want to necessarily sort out those differences as if they have to be resolved, but it's, yeah. mm -hmm. but both authors, I think, insist that things are better now that Jesus has ascended mm -hmm. than if you wish he was still, you know, walking around the Sea of Galilee in his sandals. <laughs> and if I, I use this idea of restoration, and again, I'm I'm fine with the complication and, and leaving it, I don't want to suggest that uh, we need to dive into this to resolve it. I, I agree with you on that, Matt. Um, but in, in the sense of what does it mean to be human, but to bear the image of God? What is the prayer that Jesus has said that he has and is glorifying God and that now we are able to do that because we are witnesses to God because of the Holy Spirit? And so the task becomes that very sense of drawing attention to who God is in a world that desperately needs the promise of peace, the promise of the presence of abiding in a community of love. Everything that we've been talking about in the weeks leading up to this are, uh, are underscored in these passages. And we keep telling this story so that we are reminded that this is what propels us to live in the here and now, not simply to hope for uh, a later. Yeah, and I would maybe just build on that very, very briefly, and then we should probably go on. But that's, that's the essence of what glorify means in the gospel of John yes. is to make visible the presence of God. And, and that's why I think verse 11 is so powerful here in this passage of how Jesus entrusts the community mm -hmm. to God's care as he ascends back to the father because they remain in the world mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and he will ascend but that remaining in the world, as we have seen throughout the whole farewell discourse, is a call to glorify God, is a call to make visible the presence of God, particularly in love. But we don't do that on our own. As you said, Joy, we do that because of the promise of the Spirit. Uh, but we also are able to be that in the world because of this a remarkable moment of Holy Father, protect them in your name. Mm -hmm. I, and that, that, you know, just that, yeah, that entrusting of the community to God's care. And uh, it's really, it, yeah, it's really quite beautiful. And the disciples get to overhear it too. I say this every year, yes. but it's always worth it to say it again, that you know, in John, Jesus doesn't go off to pray by himself and the disciples fall asleep, that the disciples get to hear every single word that Jesus says. And so he, they hear these words of Jesus saying to the Father, protect them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's amazing. Acts 1. <laughs> Back to the beginning. We kind of, yeah, we've kind of already been going there in a little bit. Uh, in some ways, Joyce, Joyce used the term witness already, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is uh, so important for Acts there in, in 1 8. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a little odd to feel like we're going back to the beginning in Acts. This is where the, the lectionary is lining it up with, mm -hmm. with Ascension and getting us ready for Pentecost next week. But, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that verse, chapter 1, verse 8, which is, you know, everybody many people acknowledge that seems to be the thesis statement or the kind of the organizing principle of the book of acts it's not first and foremost about geography though it's not a, a thesis of the book about geographical expansion although of course that's what what happens mm -hmm. it's a statement about bearing witness mm -hmm. first and it's not a command it's not a please maybe it's just a statement of fact it's an okay. indicative you'll be my witnesses as the church bears witness, that's what allows it then to find opportunities to expand. You know what I mean? This is not mm -hmm. a command at the outset of expansionism or colonialism or world domination or even travel for the sake of spreading the gospel. It starts mm -hmm. off basically your job is to bear witness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The travel happens as a result of that, sometimes because 
things get provocative, they get, the heat rises and it gets dangerous, sometimes because God calls them to new places. Sometimes they run into other strangers. I mean, there's all sorts of ways in which that happens. But mm -hmm. I would want to push back against people who say this is largely about heading out to the horizons. It is about that, but first and foremost, it's about your identity of of um, a follower of the of the risen and ascended Jesus is simply to tell what you know, describe what you've seen. Mm -hmm. There's a, almost a liter, literal statement of that, uh, as uh, in the in the uh, verses six uh, and seven before we get to verse eight. You know, where the question is, is this when you will restore the kingdom of, of Israel? This this is a, a question about what's happening next and how are we going to live into it? And Jesus says, you're not going to get that. You're not going to understand that. You're not going to know that. And then, as you said, Matt, but this is what will be. You will receive the power to be my witnesses. And when that happens all these other things are going to happen too. I, I really appreciate that centering, Matt, that you make here, that this is about being the witness that we were created to be in the very beginning. And as Caroline said, it's what it means to glorify. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is Jesus saying, I'm willing to answer any question. And they say, are you going to restore the kingdom? You know, that Jesus is like, there's no dumb questions. And they say, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he goes, that's a really dumb question. <laughs> he has no interest in answering that. Um, but I think it's a good question. I think they ask him a question that makes sense, given who mm -hmm. the Messiah is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And Jesus and, kind of shrugs it off and says. Be because answering that question as a centerpiece becomes a distraction from oh, yeah. how God's kingdom will be restored. Uh, God's kingdom will be restored when God is risen up, when God is king, when God is yeah. central, when God is glorified. Um, if if I may, and we can drop back if we, if we need to, but um, this is for me central to the way the Psalm 68, at least the text that we read this way, describes, uh, particularly beginning at verse six, it describes what God has done the kinds of things that Jesus came to do and actually did to bring communities uh, among those who were desolate, um, to set free those who were held captives, um, to um, be with us as we journey through the wilderness um, in the midst of the world shaking, um, the presence of God um, rains down on us. And which God is it? It is their God, the God made known in Jesus, the God uh, of, of Abraham, Isaac, mm -hmm. and Jacob. And, and, and that, that centering uh, of verse 6, 7, um, I guess I read all the way through 9 in 66, puts it back on who is God. It bears witness, not only that God is, but where has God shown up and shown out in the world? And no, I didn't read the text in the Hebrew or even in the English there. I gave you a version of joy. <laughs> the new joy well, version. And I, I think the, uh, the connections here too are, uh, and maybe, maybe putting the Psalm and the Acts text and even you know, the John text into conversation with, you know, what does it mean to glorify God? The, you, you know, you have this beautiful verse in 14, they were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that that's an, uh, and the way in which you think about how Luke ends, right, where they were constantly in the temple praising God. And here you have the Psalm text that's, you know, sing to God, praise God's name, God's majesty, God's, uh, all that, as you said, uh, joy, what God has done. And so that what marks this, this first community of believers, according to Acts, what that witness looks like is this 
this prayer and praise and I, mm-hmm. uh, and not looking up to heaven. I love that verse in particular. Yeah. Why you yeah. look, you know, why you stand looking up to heaven uh, and it's, and which really kind of is a helpful corrective to the geographical sort of, you know, uh, to the ends of the earth. It's like, mm-hmm. it's, yeah, you don't look up to heaven. You look immediately around and this is where, this is where you can glorify God in your space and place. And so, yeah, I like, I like that. Peter, we want, shall we? Yeah. Our last first Peter mm-hmm. from chapter four and chapter five. <laughs> and in a completely different mood, um, I am drawn to uh, verse eight, um, where it says, uh, discipline yourselves and keep alert. Um or the flip side of it, which is the second portion of that verse, to be reminded in the midst of all that we've talked about in Acts and in, in John and even in the Psalms, that the context in which we will be doing this is still a hostile uh, context. And after so many years of Christendom, after so many years of seeming that we've had influence in our culture, these 2000 years post uh, re- resurrection, um, we still live in a world where if you turn your attention to the God made known in Jesus, even among the people of God, you will meet hostility. And so we need to be alert to that. Um, like I said, it's a totally different mode, but I think uh, it's a critical reminder for us today because we would one would think 2000 years later, being in the in the community of God, we would find um, we would find that love. We would find that belonging. We would find God being praised. We would find what will happen later in Acts that drew so much attention, which is the gathering together of everyone and they're receiving because they belonged. Peter reminds us, not exactly. It's going to be a difficult task. Mm. Remember that. Mm. I like the verse, uh, cast all your anxiety on him. Mm. Yes. And so, like you said, Joy, it's a, I mean, you, we do have resonances here of, uh, gladness and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. So there's some themes that we can connect and, and then, but, but also that connection to suffering. Uh, but I, the verse seven, you know, cast all your anxiety on him because, um, God cares for you. Then is the preface to discipline yourselves and keep alert. So the, that reality that you're describing, Joy, is is true, and at the same time, the anxiousness of that reality can be cast can be um, put on God, and God can take it, and God can handle it. And I think that it, it, tying all of these together, because God's Spirit is with us. Mm -hmm. We can stand. God is going to do what God does. And therefore, we can do what God has called us to do or what we are compelled to do because we've been in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And, And so that balancing of not sounding like, well, if things aren't going perfect, I must have done something wrong. No, the reality is we still have this hope for the return of Christ. And but we're not gazing, we're living out the glory of God in the midst of it even when the midst is suffering.